Let's hear God's word together from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God remains forever. Please be seated. Well, it's good to be back at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Again, my name is Ian Hammond, and I am your, your RUF International Campus Minister at Northwestern University. I want to thank you once again for your, your partnership in the gospel. You are wonderful partners in the ministry, and I'm just so grateful to be on your team. I love serving international students throughout the week, but it is a special privilege to be with the body of Christ on the Lord's Day. So thank you so much for having me. This morning we are in one of the most beloved passages in all of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2. And I'd love for you, if there's a pew Bible in front of you or you brought your own Bible, to, to open it up because we're going to be looking closely at some things that are written there. And before we do that, let's, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in his word this morning. Our great God in heaven, we are just so grateful for this day that you set apart uh, for our good and your glory. We pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see uh, wonderful things from your word, and that you'd give us hearts to rejoice in the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. Be with us this morning, we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Ephesians is a remarkable letter for several reasons, and I think one very big reason this is a remarkable letter is the life story behind, uh, the life story of the author behind it. You know about the Apostle Paul. He was a Jew born in the city of Tarsus. When he was a, a young kid, likely he and his family moved to Jerusalem for his education. There he was trained in the Torah by the Pharisees under a renowned rabbi. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he says, a man who was very zealous for the law of Moses. And notably, when he had come of age, he violently opposed early Jewish Christians as the church began to sprout up across Judea. But as his life story intersected with the unfolding story of redemption, uh, his life changed altogether. He who was once the most violently opposed to the Christian church became the most courageous preacher of the Christian church, the most committed missionary, the most preeminent gospel preacher. This was his life story, and as he subsequently went around to proclaim the story of redemption, not a few times he also proclaimed what Christ had done in his own life. Now, some churches have carried on this tradition by encouraging Christians to share their personal testimony, how Christ says has worked in their life. And I think this is a, a beneficial exercise. You can ask yourself, what difference has Christ made to my life story? Now, I remember as a kid hearing some wild testimonies. There was this one man in our church who, 
had been addicted to methamphetamines, and he lived that crazy life that accompanies this decision. Uh, but he had a powerful conversion experience. And for the last 20 years, he has been a faithful husband, a faithful father, and a faithful minister of the gospel. As his story intersected with God's story of redemption, a powerful change in direction occurred. Now, when I think of these exciting personal testimonies, I also think of the seemingly boring ones as well. Maybe this is, maybe this is your story, or you know someone who has this story. It's the story of growing up in a, a covenant home, growing up in the church, and really not remembering a time that you did not have Christ as Savior and Lord. Yes, there's been some real ups and some real downs in your Christian life. You've often wondered, but God has been there with you all along. And this is a beautiful testimony as well. And what we will see this morning is that the seemingly boring and the seemingly exciting life stories, testimonies have more in common than you would initially think. In fact, anyone who has embraced Christ as Lord, in some sense, shares the same story. And what we learn from Paul this morning is understanding your story rightly makes all the difference if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian this morning, understanding your Christian friend's story just might open you up to the possibility that God might be work that be at work in you as well. And so this morning, I'd like to consider the story of the Christian in three parts, death, life, and glory. Let's go ahead and jump in. First, we have death. Paul, at the very start of our passage, describes the human condition here as dead and trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Humanity is in some sense dead, Paul says. And when we open up our Bibles, we do indeed find that this book, the Bible, is a book about life and death. From the very beginning, God is described as the fountain of life. God is the creator and sustainer of his creation. And as man is placed within God's good creation, he is placed in a lush and fruitful garden. It was there that God first breathed the breath of life into the lungs of man. And this imagery, this imagery of the garden, doesn't it evoke notions of life as well? The garden is a richly nourished place. It's a place that's been well cultivated. And notably, there in the garden is God. He's with Adam and Eve. This is the place of his dwelling. And this is where spiritual life is found. Outside of God's presence is death. And after the fall of man into sin, this is where humanity is. We walk outside of the Garden of Eden, away from God, alienated from his life-giving presence. This is the deadness Paul is referring to this morning. Humanity has an absence of spiritual life, a root of spiritual deadness. Man now walks apart from God's life-giving presence. And Paul says here in this passage that the now spiritual deadness of humanity leads to a certain walk. In other words, it takes a certain shape in one's life story. What shape does it take? Well, it takes the shape of an unholy triad, namely the world, the flesh, and the devil. Do you see it? It's right here in our passage. Verse 2, we followed the course of the world. We followed the prince of the power of air. Verse 3, we lived in the passions of our flesh. Let's take a closer look at these three. The world. Paul says we followed the world. In his book, Losing Our Virtue, David Wells uh, helpfully describes the world this way. He said the world is that system of values in any age that makes sin seem normal and righteousness seem strange. The world makes sin normal, righteousness strange. The world is what makes doing the wrong thing so easy and doing the right thing so hard. 
in Romans 12, this is why Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world. The world wants to bring us into conformity. And it does so by incentivizing, rewarding, encouraging, persuading us to depart from walking with God. We see the world at work in those nation states that are openly hostile to Christ and his church. In those economic systems filled with greed and corruption and the exploitation of the poor. In those subtle and at times not so subtle social pressures that dictate what is acceptable and expected of us. In, the, in television and music that normalize evil and stigmatize good. The world is non-conducive to spiritual life. And what Paul says this morning is that humanity alienated from God embraces the world with arms wide open. But that's not all. He also makes the claim that we have followed the prince of the power of air. Here, Paul calls the devil or Satan a prince, a ruler Through works of deception, the devil rules over his captives, peoples, and societies. And so Paul would later say in Ephesians that when we are struggling in this life, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. No, we are wrestling with cosmic powers over this present darkness. And you know, from scripture we see that the devil's main way of acting is through seducing, through false promises And through lies. This is what happened in the garden, right? Eat this and you will be like God, he said. This is what happened in the wilderness with Jesus. Bow down and worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. The seed of false religion is the messaging of Satan. And when offered an ocean filled with false promises, humanity dives in. But that's not all. Paul also says we have lived in the passions of our flesh. Here the unholy triad moves from the external to the internal. Not only does the world press us down, not only um, does our, uh, the devil hold us captive, but our own desires, we learn, lead us astray. This ultimately means that we're not mere victims We are co-belligerents with darkness. We want to walk in the direction we're walking. Our desires are bent this way. Paul gives a list of fleshly desires and fleshly works in Galatians 5. He says these are the flesh, works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, idolatry, jealousy, divisions, drunkenness, and things like these. And he warns that those, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sexual, relational, political, economic darkness reign in this age because humanity is led by fleshly lusts of the mind and the body. Now, I think it would be safe to say that the Apostle Paul, the Bible, has a very dim view of humanity. We follow the world, are held captive by Satan, driven by dark passions, created for God's glory, we exchange him for other things. And as we look around us, and as we look within us, I think we can feel, we can sense, we can see that things are not the way they ought to be. Malcolm Mugridge, an English journalist, reflecting on this dim view of of humanity and scripture said that this is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time, the most intellectually resisted fact. We see it, but there is a resistance to this view. Maybe we wonder what believing this about us would do to us. In his book titled um, Low Anthropology, the author, David Zoll, contends that Christianity would, is basically incomprehensible apart from this low view of humanity. And that though this may be off-putting initially and off-putting to some, this is actually more hopeful than you might think. He points us 
to Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is an attorney representing those on death row. And he wrote a memoir called Just Mercy. And in this memoir, you learn that the men, or many of the men that Brian advocates for, had been convicted of very wicked and very violent crimes. And when you hear the details of these crimes, feelings of sympathy are very hard to find. But why does Brian keep serving these clients? How does he occupy this very necessary yet very perplexing role within our society? Well, he says this, I do what I do because I am broken too. He later says, we are all broken by something. We all have hurt someone, have been hurt. We share a condition of brokenness, even if our brokenness is not equivalent. I could not pretend that their struggle was disconnected from my own. Our shared brokenness connected us. Our shared imperfection sustains our capacity for compassion. Do you hear what he's saying there? Brian serves in this way not because he believes he is some great man. No, he serves this way because he knows that deep down inside, the problem that his clients have is the very same problem he has. Note the pronouns in verse 3. Among whom we all once walked. The Apostle Paul puts himself alongside us in the rest of the world. The line dividing good and evil does not cut, cut between us and them. No, it cuts through the very heart of every human being. In the background here, Paul has in mind the fall of Adam into sin in the subsequent corruption of all of humankind. Another way of saying we are dead in sin is saying that we are dead in Adam, which Paul says elsewhere. And so our text says in verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath. In other words, we are far more wicked than we'd ever like to admit, justly deserving God's displeasure, which will be poured out in the age to come. This is what death looks like. And sadly, this is a part of all of our stories. But what about life? What happens when the God of the Bible meets those dead in sin? Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Life is what happens when the God of the Bible meets those dead in sin. God brings those who are dead to life. Left to our own devices, we could not conjure up the good works or faith necessary to commend ourselves to God. Dead men do nothing but be dead. The enemies without and the enemies within would not allow this to be the case. But the God of immeasurably great power, he can do it. He can bring dead people to life. And he does this for one very big reason. Verse 4, because of the great love with which he loved us. You know, against the impressions of many, the Bible's description of God in his interaction with humanity is heavily tilted in the direction of love. First John twice says, God is love. And probably the most powerful and profound description of God in the Bible, uh, it comes from Exodus 34, and it comes out of the very mouth of God. This is a self-description After Moses cuts the tablets for the Ten Commandments, he's there on Mount Sinai. The Lord descends upon the mountain with Moses, and it says that he proclaimed his very name. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, for giving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity on the fathers and on the children of the children to the third and fourth generation. 
in this self-description, his love, his mercy comes first. It takes up more space. It is said to extend to thousands. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And yet he does this without compromising his justice or holiness, though it certainly plays a supporting role. In Ezekiel 33, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's displeasure with death and his great love for his people is the ground of his grace to them. God does not give us grace so that he can love us. God loves us, and so he gives us grace. God has great love for you this morning. Do you believe this? The movement from death to life in this passage is summed up with the aside in verse 5. By grace you have been saved. Now this term saved, it's a familiar term. It has a long history in the Bible. The prototypical salvation event in Scripture is God's salvation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. The Israelites, after going into Egypt because of a famine, prosper there. But as another Pharaoh arises, they are subjugated to a very harsh form of slavery. But God, in an act of sovereign judgment upon Egypt and great love for his people, he redeems them out of slavery, brings them through the waters of the Red Sea, and establishes them in his kingdom. And we learn, and we read this morning, actually, in our Old Testament reading, that this was due to grace. It wasn't because they were big and mighty. No, they were small and puny. It wasn't even because they were better people than the Egyptians. It was because of the blood of the Passover lamb over the doorposts of their house. In this movement out of slavery in Egypt into the kingdom of God prefigures the movement in our passage out of slavery to sin in Adam into freedom in Christ Jesus. Do you see it? Verse 5. God made us alive with or in Christ Jesus. He raised us up with Christ Jesus. He seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Salvation is found in Christ Jesus alone. In Christ, God transfers us from death to life, from this world to heavenly places, from the domain of the devil to the kingdom of God, from wrath to grace. It is through our union with Christ that we find freedom. Now, this all sounds a bit mysterious, right? Like, what does it mean to be in Adam? What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, we can say a few things about this. We were legally united with Adam because he was our representative before God. When God is relating to Adam in the book of Genesis, he is relating to humanity through Adam because he is our mediator. He was our, our covenant head. And so when Adam sinned, his sin, the guilt he incurred was not just to himself, but it was to everyone he represented. But it's more than this. There's another aspect to our union. It's more organic and spiritual. In some mysterious sense, we were in Adam, spiritually and truly. Adam was the root of the entire human race. And so when he sinned, He not only brought legal consequences on us all, he also brought moral corruption and spiritual corruption, the corruption of human nature itself. But the God of great love sends Christ into the world. And when Christ comes, he comes as our second Adam. And when he comes, he lives the life that we should have lived. He dies the death we should have died. And he rises victoriously from the grave all the way back up into the life-giving presence of God. And as we are moved under his representation and into union with him by the Spirit, we receive his legal status in his spiritual life. He becomes a new root, a root of spiritual aliveness. This brings us to our final point, glory. Glory. 
Now, as soon as we start speaking of dead people and alive people, we are walking on some dangerous ground. And the danger is this. It's to say, to look at yourself and say, I'm alive. And to look at others and say, they are dead. And then conclude from this that this might be the case because of something due to you. Aware of this great danger, Paul in our final section here takes aim. He takes aim at boasting. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If it wasn't clear enough, Paul says the same thing in several ways. By grace, not your own doing not the result of works, a gift. He says everything he can do, he says everything he can to clarify that the reason you have new life is by the grace of God alone. God the Father planned your salvation. God the Son accomplished your salvation. And God the Spirit applies your salvation by bringing you from death to life. Your spiritual aliveness has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your intelligence. It has nothing to do with your competence. It has nothing to do with your moral rigor. You know, as far as I can tell, this is the only redemption in the world that is understood in this way. World religions, in the end, place the attainment of salvation in the individual. You know, this is even true for those of us who are secular. We may not believe in God or the devil or heaven and hell, but we do believe in salvation along other lines. We believe that some are good and others are not. We may boast and believe that we're ultimately good because of our politics, and so we look down our noses at the other side. We may boast and believe we're good because of our grades, because of our nation. We have particular standards and characteristics by which we separate the good and the bad. This seems to be inevitable. You know, some have tried to solve this problem by saying things like, do not judge. Do not just do not judge. But when those people come into contact with people who do have moral standards and judgments, another problem of arises. In this case, the relativists are good and the fundamentalists are bad, or vice versa. Without erasing the line of good and evil, sin and righteousness, the Apostle Paul articulates a system of salvation that leaves no room for boasting. Now, Paul is interested in leaving no room for boasting for several reasons. Um, But the supreme reason is in the text that we just read. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Paul wants what will be clear then to be clear right now. That the only one who will receive glory for the salvation of man is God alone. And this is remarkable. Think about this. In God's pursuit of his own glory, we find our greatest good. We find immeasurable riches of grace in kindness. You know, when I was a college student, my RUF group went to a very impoverished town in, our, in Mississippi where I grew up. And in this town, the school system, a catastrophe. Access to healthy, healthy food and medical care, scarce. Economic activity, non-existent. Families, broken. We went there to volunteer for the day with a pastor. We were there just hanging out with high schoolers. We played some basketball. Later in the evening, we'd eat a meal together and have a Bible study. And there at this ministry, I met a guy named Zero. Everyone was calling this guy Zero. And after some time, 
I leaned over to the pastor and I said, you know, why are they, why are they calling him Zero? And he told me, well, they call him Zero because he was too small for the football team, not coordinated enough for the basketball team, and not smooth enough to get a girlfriend. He was a Zero. He didn't have anything to offer. And I can still remember it as we were sitting in this pastor's house, seeing the grin on this, this young man's face. And the pastor said, he used to believe he was zero too, but he doesn't anymore. Later that night at Bible study, uh, the pastor asked my friend who organized this trip to, to share his testimony. And I remember thinking, what on earth is my friend going to say to connect to these people here? His life experience was so different. He went to a private school. He drove a nice car. Never worried about food scarcity or poor health care. My friend got up and he turned to Ephesians chapter 2 and he said, this is my testimony. I was dead in sin, walking hand in hand with the world, the flesh, and the devil. But God brought me from death to life. The loving God brought me from death to life and gave me a new purpose to serve him in this world. Nodding with agreement, Zero said, "This your story is my story. You see, when Zero encountered the story of redemption, that those who are dead can be brought to life and used for God's glory, everything changed. People still called this young man Zero, but those same people were now being served by him. He had a purpose, a dignity, a dignity not based upon how impressive or great he was. No, a dignity based upon how greatly loved by God he was. Where he was once subdued and ashamed and cowardly, he now stood tall on the rock-solid love of God for him in Jesus Christ. And he was pushed out to others in service and good works he was serving even his very bullies. And he was doing this because he knew that God had prepared these things for him. Paul ends our section by saying, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared for us, that we should walk in them. The story of salvation is a story of death and sin, life in Christ, the glory of God, and the good of this world. The question I want to leave you with, is this your story? Let's pray. Our great God in heaven, when we had nothing to offer, you offered us everything. When we had nothing to bring to the table, you gave us everything the broken body in the shed blood of your son, your very son. And so we know, Lord, despite our many sins and weaknesses and many failings, that you love us. You loved us uh, even before we had life. You loved us into life. And for that, we praise and honor your holy name. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would Bring deep down into our hearts this story so that we might be able to stand fast against all the false stories about us that we hear in this world. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.